uh, Deborah, we're um, officially recording. Maybe first off to, to ask um, how you are generally um, with uh, sheltering <laughs> and um, not necessarily how you're managing, but maybe what you're managing is a, a better way to put it. You mean in relation to this COVID-19? Yeah, yeah. How am I sheltering? Uh, I mean, well, how am I managing? I can't say that I, I'm managing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm kind of floating. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, I feel like I need to practice every day. And, um, but I must say there are days when I don't. Yeah. Um, which is not typical of me. And um, I'm eating a lot. I, I guess I could say I'm managing to make, I'm managing my food very well. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm eating well. That's good. <laughs> and, ab and abundantly. <laughs> but, um, I could I could also afford to put on weight, so I'm not I'm not terribly worried about it. Yeah, I wouldn't be worried um, about that either. Uh, I've been thinking I, a lot about that. A, yeah, I think that's about if 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 I had to describe how I'm managing, I am managing my groceries and my food to make yeah. sure that I have three. I I mean I don't even normally eat three meals a day. Yeah, yeah. You know I'm going for about five or you know, <laughs> three three medium size and two small i mean just you know if anything comes into my mind to eat i eat it and prepare i'm enjoying preparing it a lot yeah a lot, yeah a lot of pleasure in food preparation yeah i mean i guess that you know these are ways in which we're sort of transferring the practice you know whatever practice we normally would have you know and i've been finding that for myself it's you know I haven't been doing a dance practice as much as I would. And at first I was really disturbed by it. Um, but then I'm also trying to practice some patience and, um, you know, which is, I think, relevant <laughs> right now. Um, or at least maybe these conditions are sort of forcing that on everybody. And I've been thinking a lot about um, this notion of co the continuity of discontinuity. I've been thinking a lot about that mm -hmm. and not only in terms of practice, but in terms of reality. <laughs> um, it feels really um, like right here uh, uh, for me. Um, but also just that, you know, that because you have been, you know, I know that you are working, you're working on some new material uh, for Kohlberg. Um, and, um, you know, that last line in that draft, which I don't know if you feel comfortable with me saying what that last line is, because it's so, when I read it, I burst out laughing because it was so, um, it, was really meaningful to me. Um, so I just want to say what that is, if you feel comfortable with me saying that. Um, uh, not wanting to practice is good medicine for practicing. And, you know, it's simple, but I feel like it's really profound. Like I, like, you know, to, and I feel like this is part of your work too. It's like how you integrate um, everything. Uh, it, you know, it's how you attend to integrating what's, uh, what's available to you. And um, yeah, so I've been thinking about those two things, the continuity of discontinuity and that last line um, for myself. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for reminding me <laughs> yeah um, you know oh, yeah. I, you know in terms of um, lineage just to kind of get right into it do you I mean it's it's 
it's pretty common knowledge that you, you know, you worked with Cunningham for a bit and you're, you were part of the Judson dance theater, but do you, when you think of your work, do you feel like you're a part of a specific lineage that you're in line to a certain choreographer or to a certain movement or artistic practice? You know, I, uh... I, I, you know, I, I do and I don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, in terms of an artistic practice, you know, I would say John Cage yeah. had more of an influence on me than Merce in yeah. a way. Um, you know, Merce, I, I, I could say that Merce gave me, um, some tools, which I didn't experience in my body, mm. but I experienced watching his work, mm. uh, which is time and space. Yeah. Um, those were tools that, you know, I, as you know, I, I use, I, I very differently, but as, as vital material, hmm. um, that. And when you think, and when you think about, like when you first started, or was it just like a continuity? Like, you know, these were the tools that, that Merce was working with, and then you transferred did you think of it like that or? No, no, no. I don't, it didn't occur to me till much later. Yeah. How I, how I was touched by seeing his work, how mm. deeply I was touched by seeing. I mean, I knew I was touched by his work right at the, the from the very first time I saw his work, but knew how I was touched by his work did not occur to me till much till much later yeah well you know when i began to get really interested in choreography mm. well that's interesting that's that's when i started um and and that didn't happen till late in my, yeah. i think in my career so um yeah where is john john's yeah. work just kind of freed me up so deeply yeah. You know, and I knew it. Yeah. I knew it so clearly. It was so important a yeah. shift yeah. in thinking about making work. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting like um how how one experiences something in their body. You know, like how they experience it in their body and that makes a, a specific kind of sense as opposed to intellectually it you understand what these tools are you understand the importance of this um and i think that's yeah an amazing distinction i mean like how when you were working with merce that's how you met jo john cage right right and then they were they were just in the studio. John was always well, in the you know, at, yeah, no, at the same time that that was at the same time that I was working with Jetson. Right, right, right. So John's John's theories of composition were introduced right at the start right. by Robert Dunn. Yeah. As, yeah. As, as tools for for choreography using these these same methods, I could say, of chore of this the, the, the the same yeah they were you know john's methods of composition uh which were not methods but john's theories mm. of musical composition I, that was happening right alongside mm. um the the working with merce yeah that's great um when you say you didn't become interested in choreography until really later. When yeah. when was that? Like, how how? I mean, I know when it was, but 
yeah. just curious yeah. for for people listening and watching yeah i think i mean i mean really interested in choreography mm. did not happen till you know uh till i made the match right and i you, mean even yeah. e even the solo performance commissioning projects where i would make these solos it was really about a way to a way to put stuff together and and, and create a situation where young artists would or not just young uh, artists would feel good about practicing really right. really good about what practice that's what i was interested in how to you know make practice something really exciting but it wasn't until uh how you really put a piece together with more than one <laughs> with more than one person right you know? right yeah um and i you know how do, how do you that I really became interested in choreography. I think that's true. I, I mean, that's it's yeah. sort of what I what I feel. I've always thought about your ensemble works, and I've you know, it wasn't until much later in my period of working with you that I actually did a solo, because uh, you know I didn't go through the solo commissioning project um, process like other folks did. So my introduction to your work was always through ensemble work. But I always thought, and I never told you this, but I always thought that your ensemble work was from the perspective of the solo performer. It, we just happened to be five people or seven people. And I always felt like that was an amazing, because I consider myself, well, I'm an, you know, I'm an ensemble performer, but I also like really consider myself a solo performer in my own work as well. And so that always resonated with me. But I also think that that's what makes the choreography super specific because it does come from that solo performer perspective. And so it's interesting that, you know, Animals on the Beach, your newest ensemble work independent of um Kohlberg is is exactly that it's <laughs> five soloists um <laughs> in an ensemble and and how you constructed a choreography mm -hmm. around that around that concept uh -huh. and it didn't really occur to me until recently that that's you know that's always kind of what i thought i mean uh -huh. that, that's probably not you know, from your perspective as the choreographer from the outside, but but performing it from the inside, I always felt that. Oh, um, it was very much, I mean, don't you remember, I wanted to make a piece for five soloists and nobody knew who the soloist was. <laughs> yes. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Not even the soloist. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone the audience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's so great that you would say that because I, it makes me think that that that's where pra the, it, one's individual practice using these tools, that is where, you know, e and even though that practice involves seeing and being in relationship to the other, the other dancers who you're dancing with, it's dependent, it's essentially the core of it, is everybody's individual practice. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's maybe what you were seeing when you said, when you originally saw yeah. the, 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 one wasn't, you know, one wasn't in a, sec was ever a secondary or mm. in the ensemble. Yeah because of how people were learning how to practice together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think specifically, like, when I first saw the match, you know, I had been seeing your solo works for quite some time before that, and then also seeing Roz doing your solo works. But specifically, when I saw the match, I think there's also something particular 
you know, about each of those performers being, you know, the agency of the performer as choreographer, which is, you know, like a core aspect to your work. Um, yeah, it's, it's precisely what you're saying that there is no background or foreground, you know, there's, you know, everybody is, um, um, yes, stepping up <laughs> to their own practice and um um yeah i'm just curious also about the interest in choreography and i don't even know if this is a question a, for, a formulated question but the interest in choreography that might be different than the interest in performing or dancing and because I feel like all three of those things are really integral to your work and I can't, I can't, sometimes I really can't separate, I can't separate practice, performance, dancing and choreography from your work. And mm -hmm. um, I just wonder, yeah, how, if those things are different for you or how they're different or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, but um, I think that's that's a great, that's a great observation. I mean, for instance, if a movement is turning without turning, you know, how 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 does how any one person <laughs> does that? Yeah, is a dependent on that performer, you know, applying that impossible task to the moment. You know, I mean, it it's true. It, it's like nothing, nothing is is nothing is given. Mm. You know, it, and it's the difference that actually is interesting. To, like yeah and that becomes part of the yeah. choreography and part of the mm. part of the performance and part of the dancing yeah yeah that's great i think a lot about um i'm struck in listening to you um how much absurdity figures in to your work and um, and also the design, I would say the design of your language that is super specific and it's almost like a good joke, you know, like, like you have to design it <laughs> so that the punchline or like how it unfolds is not known. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm just curious, like, where does this element of absurdity like why is that so cr crucial to you like where does where does that come from i i think it comes from um without it being conscious i think it comes from an attraction to eastern philosophy hmm. i think it comes from you know like the element of paradox hmm. which you know i don't think i could have lived this long in any sane way if, if i didn't um if if i if i didn't at some and i it's really on i feel like at some unconscious level i embrace these elements of um of i buddhist um buddhist what like it's not philosophy buddhist ethics mm. buddhist, you know um 
and the and the and not just again and you know the the presence of the I Ching in, in in my life and I think you know it was you know there again it goes back to John and the I didn't know that the, about you <laughs> oh yeah I I consulted the I Ching for a really long time oh, wow okay. through the uh, I would say through most of the seventies this okay. is something actually I'm just being made aware of which is something Laurent Pichot is, has yeah. been pointing out to me like a lot of my earlier group pieces were based on I would throw the I Ching before a large group workshop for the just the big message for that particular message for that particular workshop okay. and it really and and that that paradox that shows up in absolutely every single hexagram I think that you know, it was so, it was such a relief hmm. to me that to, to consider, you know, heaven below. Hmm. Such a relief to me to consider that. Hmm. That it wasn't all about your will on something. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. Look at look at where this got that that gets us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the shitstorm that we're in right now. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, funny. Speaking of Laurent, I yeah, like I um in preparation for this um for this talk, I was thinking a lot about the the re perspective at Tonsum August that happened this past summer in Berlin and which feels like a lifetime ago now. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, just in terms of legacy, you know, well, first of all, that this, that this festival was sort of framed around the the 45 years or more of your legacy um and that it was not called a retrospective it was called a reperspective and so i'm curious about that reframing of that neologism and also yeah what that process was like for you to kind of look back and also look forward um because it was huge. It was a huge undertaking. Yeah, it was, you know, it, it feels like it was just a uh, continuation of my, of my process in general. Mm. I mean, um, that's why, you know, I asked Dance in August not to call it a retrospective, but a re-perspective, because I have never had the opportunity, I had never had the opportunity to revisit earlier works yeah. before, other than 10. Right, right. Which I could revisit, but, um, um, but the other pieces that were there that were earlier works, I had never had that opportunity, nor did I even have a desire Mm. to do it. I mean, I was always moving on to the next, right. the next uh, evolution of my work. So it was wonderful to see pieces transformed. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was pretty really remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. It w was thrilling for me to see, first of all, that they still had the appeal um, that they did then they i didn't feel like i was going back in time mm, mm -hmm. I, it, as a member of the audience i didn't feel like i was watching something that had a certain datedness to it mm. is that um, important to you like maybe maybe even seeing something that's historical it's, has relevance but i i agree like i didn't sense that either in any of the work which i think speaks also to the kind of timelessness of your work or like it it's not i think because the you're not seeing a form i think it's precisely because you don't 
you don't fix a form, like you're not going for like this concrete sediment of something, um, that yeah. it's still, it has the potential of being uh, very timely. Um, but what would it mean for something of yours to look historical? Yeah. Like, would that be bad or? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it's a, it's a funny question. I have no idea. Mm, mm. <laughs> I mean, not that I think it would look bad, but, you know, I mean, I found something out by, by, mm. by the permission and the invitation yeah. of Dance in August to do those works. I found, I found out that um, that what you said earlier about it's not about the choreography from the from the when was it the two thousand and four let's say with the match it's not about the choreography then and my choreography now mm -hmm. it it was it has to do with the people. Who were the performers, mm. the dancers who were dancing, mm. you know, the same impossible tasks. Yeah. You know, within a within their own um with their own consistency of practice, mm. you know, with um that that keeps the dances alive. I, I mean yeah. Yeah, I remember was... once when I was touring with uh, Misha, right in the Pass Forward project. At the very what they what I what they wanted to do was to do one of my group pieces. So we were going to do Exit. Mm -hmm. So I gave him permission to to do Exit. Well, what he did was he looked at the video of Scott Heron performing Exit <laughs> at Judson Church. <laughs> And that's what he said about <laughs> choreographing <laughs> to teach a group of untrained performers. <laughs> oh my God! And until I untrained in your and, in your work. Well, in my in my work, yeah. Untrained they were in trained. terms of a community piece right, was open right, right. for you know. Oh, I see. Yeah. I mean, ori originally it was a solo. Yeah. But then we were going to do it as a group piece. I had taught it several times previously as a group piece, and colleges and universities love doing it. Yeah. Um, but so when but when pass forward, Misha's approach was to, it was so sweet. But you know, take that you know, like indelible, yeah. like this is yeah. the choreography. The yeah, 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 yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And it was it was like, wait a minute. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting because I'm really struck, like, I've been thinking a lot about transmission and, you know, in this time, like, you know, some people have asked me to teach classes online and I've been sort of resistant to it because I, I think I've just been reflecting on what actually gets transmitted, you know, if you're not in the room. And then I was thinking about your work. And there's so much in the construction and the design of language that creates this permission for possibility. But it's not only that, because you have it's the application of it that is also specific. And so it's not seeing, just that you can seeing, seeing the application of it. Well, it's no, it's the practice of it. It's like the, okay, it's like okay. the dance. It's like the dancer's application of that practice right. over time. Right. That's right. not just about reading right. these words and then you do the choreography. It's right. like that's where the I think that's where it gets it gets confusing for some people, and it also like where the thrill of it for those of us who have been doing it for a long time is like. Yeah, you could be practicing this language for three months and like after like the fourth month, it's it's completely different. Like your application of it mm -hmm. is completely different. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't know if, uh, wh where the question is in that for you, but how, does that resonate for you? Like this, what is the transmission, I guess, like in your work? Like how do you transmit the information? Because it's in the language, but it's also something else. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's why I think you could, you're, you, you're, you and Roz are the only two examples of people who I feel can transmit mm. this material because of your experience with it. Mm. It can't be done in writing. Right. It absolutely cannot be done in writing. I, I mean, the writing part of my work is something else entirely. It, mm -hmm. it isn't to transmit. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's about writing. Right. It's about writing, not about transmission. It needs the voice of experience. It needs mm -hmm. your voice. It needs my voice. Yeah. What, you know, you get a voice like this teaching something at my work, and, you know, <laughs> nobody is going to hear it. No, it's totally true, because I, you know, your voice is very particular. I mean, when you say your voice, you mean the I mean, dancing I mean, voice but the real voice the 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 the, um, the voice of somebody who has been working on finding out just what's possible for you know yeah. i've been experiencing it yeah, and you've been experiencing it yeah it's yeah. in the voice yeah yeah that's interesting yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that, but it, when you say it, it, it's true because I, when you coach, when you specifically coach, when you're in the room, there's a, there's a way in which you speak that's not like the voice that you're speaking in now. It's like some other voice, and I think it's an embodied voice, like, yeah, from that place of experience, from that place of practicing, you know, how long has it been? 47 years? More than that. It's more than that. <laughs> uh, 1970. Yeah. 50 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I guess I'm thinking also about it because of this, you know, this new role that I have the opportunity of being in with Kohlberg, you know, like shepherding some of your work. And yeah, I've been thinking about that, about transmission, like what is, what is it? Um, and yeah, so that's, that's also good to ground myself in that, like that it's, um, the voice of experience as well. You know, and I'm also thinking about seeing mm -hmm. because you're, you're also seeing the people that I'm, that you're working with. Right. So it's in your voice, but it's also you're, I'm attending mm. to how the voice, how the material is being transmitted. I, you know, I'm looking at 18 other people at the same time I'm transmitting it, at the same time I'm in this, in my practice with all of them at yeah. the same time. And that you have enough experience to recognize just like what to say, you know, just mm -hmm. a moment out from watching somebody else. You have that experience of yeah. seeing what it looks like so that you can keep coaching. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so it isn't like these fixed um, uh, methods that produces something. It's like this toolbox that you um, draw from. Yeah, I've been thinking also like in terms of that toolbox, um, you know, you're like for so many years, your work was based on these questions. Um, and the questions were there to kind of excite the dancer, to compel the dancer, to keep coming back to the questions when they, you know, got kind of stuck in the seduction of what they were doing. Um, and the questions were sort of like this, um, 
this spark, this uh, of potential, like a possibility, um, something that you could never answer, something that was unanswerable, like it wasn't there to be answered. It was only there to be asked. Mm -hmm. And so now you've moved into removing the question. And so I'm just really curious, you know, I know that that's particular also to your specific practice, how you're practicing, but also how it's changing, you know, the practice that you're sharing with others and how that's also then changing your choreography. And yeah, I'm just curious um, what thoughts you have about that. Ooh, you know, I think it would be wonderful to hear what your experience <laughs> is of, you know, having worked with the questions. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, so, you know, I feel like um, I do remember a kind of terror and also thrill of having these questions um, and when I first started working with you and not not knowing, like just really just being in this free fall of um, not knowing what the outcome or the consequence of practicing these questions would be. And over time, even though, you know, like those, I, be, I, I came to appreciate really the specificity of the questions, like what over time, what practicing those questions could do not that they were necessarily questions in and of themselves and so for me like removing the question it feels like the question is still there <laughs> it's not in the form of a question but that spirit or what that does in my body is still present you know that that possibility or that potential so. isn't that though wouldn't you say that that is a result of your long experience of working with the questions yeah so that, i mean i think for myself i don't i don't have to d deal with those questions but they it, it's in my body yeah yeah it's sort of like i for instance until very recently i you know being served by how i'm seeing I don't mm. have to, I don't have to go through that language. Mm. What if every cell in my body is served by, by how I see? My body just has come to appreciate and it, it owns it. Yeah. You know? I, I don't need to go through that language. It's an experience that I've done enough so that my body has learned yeah to 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 take it on yeah to step up to it without having to be reminded it's there yeah is that yeah no i'm just that, thinking yeah, about yeah, listening yeah, and thinking yeah. about it i just have two more questions and yeah. one is in relation to that do you feel like your work has changed over the years like You know, in some, I I'm, I think this a lot now when I'm practicing. It it feels I can't. You know, it, I can remember at different times in the evolution of my work where I think. I can't imagine going, doing any, having anything more than this experience right now. Mm -hmm. You know, even what if where I am is what I need was so great. It was so great for somebody. I mean, I, and I would think, you know, where do you go from here? Yeah. Where do you go from here? And then something, and then another practice would come along and, and then I go, where do you go from here? This is just <laughs> so much. And I'm in a place now where I think, 
come on, where do I go from here? You know, this is so enriching to my soul. Yeah. You know, where do I, where could I possibly go from here? You know, I, and I'm not looking for it. I don't want to go somewhere else. Right, right. You know, yeah, I, I, I think don't that's what's remarkable somewhere. about it. I mean, you don't even think about it being, ra- you, th- I mean, this is what's also remarkable to me is like, you don't think about it being radical or pioneering. You're just yeah. in it. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, you know, like speaking of legacy, you know, like, and we've t- talked about this in different ways over the years, but you know, your work on some level has become ubiquitous, you know, like, uh, you know, but what does that mean? It just means like, it's all over the place. But people don't know what the source is anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I find that that's really interesting. It's like, particularly with a work that doesn't have a concrete form to it like how do you define it like how do you recognize it and um you know as a yeah as a practitioner of your work and also someone who's shepherding your work out in the world like i think a lot about that you know like the specificity of it um but i think from your point of view you're like yeah it's change it's it's not this or that it's like you know you embrace this sort of change of it or its mutability um you know to varying degrees i know it's not you know like anything goes but um yeah so uh yeah i've just been thinking about that like where the source is you know and then my last question, which is actually a question that came up um, from Jared, and uh, it may, um, yeah, legacy. Legacy is a you know interesting um, thing. Um, is how you might be remembered or um, how your work is carried on in terms of its legacy. Is that important to you? At some level, I think it is. For instance, I've looked at videos, I not many, and only once or twice, mm. where it has used my name as the choreographer. Right. And I have no friggin' idea what it is I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is what and, I mean about the ubiquity of it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And um, it, it makes me sick. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, I'm kind of responsible for what I've set in motion. Yeah. And so I don't look at those videos <laughs> right. at all. Right. Yeah. I, just, I just can't relate to them. Yeah. But the fact that there's you and the fact that there's Roz in the world, you know, yeah. who could potentially pass my work on to other dance companies who might be interested right. in really digging their heels into you know a f- at minimum of a four-week process before even considering doing my work um that makes me very happy and that yeah. makes me think i ca- yes i do care and um, mm-hmm. yeah 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 that's um you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very particular generation of 
a kind of democratic, like truly democratic thinking, you know, like, you know, speaking of, you know, the sort of Judson, the, 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 the forms and practices that came out of the Judson um, period, you know, like there's, there's a kind of horizontal or democratic approach, you know, like, yeah, this is a shareable experience rather than like the hold of the author, you know, which is very capitalistic. Um, but I think like, I think what's important is understanding or respecting the, um, the source again, like, like what the, or like even the, 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 the power, the empowering nature of what a practice can do over time and not to be in, a, in, a, in an assumption to know what that is. I mean, I've been working with you on and off since 2005 and I still don't know what I'm doing, you know, like, <laughs> it, and, you know, it, it, it's like, how incredible is that? You know, like to really, like to not, to be constantly in a place of unknowing um, and to re be revisiting that. Um, so I think the, the, um, uh, the danger is actually in making an assumption that you do know what the work is. Um, that I think is very special to, to your, your, what you offer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. I was just thinking of one thing, you know, that has become, continues to be really important to me in terms of um, talking about legacy that, and it's, it's, you've heard me say that over and over again, the importance of saying it's not the practice. Right. It's not the practice. I'm not handing anybody a practice. Right. I'm giving people tools to discover their own practice and how they practice. Mm. How they practice. And I think that that's what you're talking about when you say, I, have, I still don't know what it is that I'm doing. It's mm. that rediscovery of yourself through how you through how you practice yeah you know um I, I, and and the, the the importance of reminding people over and over again to every time they bring it up not there is no practice there is mm. your practice yeah yeah that's great that's a great reminder and a really important distinction yeah yeah. That's great, Deborah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Very <laughs> truly. Yeah. Um well, I'm going to um just stop recording, but I'll still stay on. Thanks again, Deborah. Yeah, okay. I'll stay on too. Okay. <laughs>